Today's lecture is on post-normal science. This is an introduction to this very interesting topic in science and policy. Now, post-normal science, okay, before we get into that, perhaps we, it's good to recall Thomas Kuhn's idea of normal science, which is puzzle solving. And if you do your puzzles, Science is likened to a, a puzzle solving exercise. And if you're able to fit the pieces, then you'll get the answer. And how do you fit the pieces? Then that's by using the scientific method and the methodologies that are needed to answer the scientific problem. Now, post-normal science is about when the science theories that we create have a certain degree of uncertainty. And I think we all know about this. There is uncertainty in scientific conclusions. And the paradigms that we accept are simple, okay? And that allows us to understand natural phenomenon using Kuhn's normal science approach. However, these paradigms do not really represent the complex phenomena that we are faced with. And, uh, and also, science is value-laden, which means that scientists have their own values in creating scientific theories, identifying scientific problems, and even in applying this to technological uh, approaches or applications and also for policy, for, the, for governance and the good of society. Now, post-normal science was first proposed by the two, two scholars, uh, Jerome Bravets, uh, a mathematician and a philosopher of science, and Silvio Funtovich, an analytic philosopher who looked at the problem of quality of science in public policy. Now, uh, Professor Ravet was uh, is based in Israel, while Professor Funtovich is in Italy. Now, uh, as you can see, uh, the two scholars, uh, mathematician and philosopher of science, and the other one is an analytical philosopher, wanted to apply to look into the quandaries or problems of scientific knowledge when it is applied to answer for social problems. So they came, it came up with a, a book before, and that is, this is the scientific knowledge and its social problems. Now, scientific theories are uncertain. Okay? There, are, there is a degree of uncertainty, and what good scientists do is to make sure that these uncertainties are are kept to a minimum and are manageable. Now, when we're applying it to the social sphere or in so-called social practice of science, then the uncertainties tend to be even more because human societies are complex. Okay, the first scientist to look into this is actually a doctor, Ludwig Fleck, who is considered to be the medical researcher that started STS as a discipline. And according to Dr. Fleck, there are so-called immensurable theories, which are created by thought collectives, which have their own community values. And in doing so with all of those factors, they tend to create scientific facts, which they communicate to different sectors of society. Now, post-normal science is, by definition, according to Jerome uh, Ravetz and Funtovich, when facts are uncertain, values are in dispute, stakes are high, and decisions are urgent. So we probably would have to make a decision if there is a very pressing problem and the stakes are quite high. If we don't do anything, then we tend to have a very negative outcome. If we do something, we have the chance of a positive outcome. Therefore, we need to have an urgent decision. However, the science that will inform that is uncertain. So how are we going to deal with uncertainty, manage the uncertainty so that we will come up with a more or less positive outcome in solving a problem that confronts us? So that was the question of Puntovich and Ravetz. So, they observed that science is not done for reasons of for curiosity alone, but is asked to support for preconceived value-based agendas. These could be political, ideological, or even theological. 
if we're going to solve a social problem, a, pro a problem that deals with human society, which requires information from science and technology, therefore it will intersect with the politics, the ideology of people in, who are concerned, and even their religious beliefs. So while in normal science, as we have discussed in module one, uh, science is not just finding and getting the facts right. It's properly contextualizing those facts so the outcomes of the applications of science and technology will be positive. The facts, okay. Scientific method may will allow us to get our facts right. But the facts may be right in that sense, but they have values. In fact, those values have to be identified. No? And uh, these values deal not with the quality of your scientific data, but rather the package, the social package that comes with it. For instance, if we're going to apply science and technology to solve the, to solve the energy crisis, everybody would, would uh, propose different uh, modalities like uh, uh, coming up with re renewables or making non-renewables more efficient. E each proponent would have their political and ideological values why they want to push through with such a, such a scientific intervention or application. And so facts have all their levels of truthiness. And I think we already talked about truthiness in module one. Yeah. Now, truthiness is an is how your scientific facts would represent the complex nature of human society and its interactions with, with them. So the key elements of post-normal science, the first one is the appropriate management of uncertainty, quality, and the value-ladenness of scientific information. So that's management. Then we need to consider the plurality and commitments and perspectives of stakeholders who require scientific information. And of course, number three, scientific information would have to be peer reviewed to determine if it's uh, the robustness of scientific conclusions. So there needs to be an internal extension of a professional peer community in this review. But, but in the post-normal sense, you expand this peer community, not just limited to the professional scientists, but even to citizens who are knowledgeable about science. And eventually, you, have, you will have to consult the wider community in consultation. So I think at this point, we get the idea of post-normal science in which um, it is actually to make sure that scientific outcomes are positive when applied to society and with the participation of stakeholders and in their consultation. And the first major issue that, that, that face the people who propose the post-normal science paradigm is the precautionary principle in which they state that if there are threats and serious or, or irreversible damage and there's lack of full scientific certainty, these should not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent environmental degradation. This is a very important principle in environmental science. Uh, it's possible to identify scientists and society to identify that there are threats or irreversible damages of human activities. But the data that can tell us how serious this is, isn't enough. So there's lack of full scientific certainty. But that's not a reason to postpone cost-effective measures to prevent the irreversible damage. The question now is how much scientific information do you need in order to do that? And, and that is something that has to be determined by society at large. We can have a very strict application of the precautionary principle in which we put a lot of proof. We need the scientific data before we can act. Okay, as much scientific data we can. Unfortunately, it's possible in, a, in, in this meme, 
uh, the frog in the in the cat in the saucepan. Okay, uh, the frog on the left would say, "When we get out, we will get out. When you prove, we will be boiled alive." So you get a lot of data, but by that time, it may be too late. Or the other frog says, "We should get out until you can prove that we won't be boiled alive." In fact, uh, you don't need enough data to do that as long as there is some reasonable amount of information for you to conclude that you have to get out of the saucepan. So that is more of the precautionary nuance application approach. So the question is, which uh, end of the evidence spectrum will you, or the evidence uh, measure, will you take a position and decide when, do you need a lot of data to do that or just have enough data that is interpretable. And even if you don't have that in much data, then you can precautionarily decide. Now, of course, uh, this has to be framed in the proper cultural context. Now, uh, the Japanese are quite remarkable because uh, a lot of information on, on many topics, cultural, uh, scientific, are presented in terms of manga. So climate change is presented in, in, in manga. Okay? Of course, what is presented in manga is informed by the scientific facts. But of course, a lot of people will not be able to completely comprehend immediately graphs on climate change like what we have in the right. So that has to be translated into cultural context. That is understandable to a lot of people. Now in the Philippines, we had a similar quandary before. Uh, the whole question of testing uh, BT talong, okay? Um, these are genetically modified uh, vegetables would allow, would allow for pest resistance. So the question is, is there enough scientific data to show that uh, genetically modified eggplant or talong is harmful to the environment and to human society as a whole? So in 2015, the Supreme Court of the Philippines decided that, uh, that there was not much enough data. And so the Supreme Court decided to strict a very strict application of a precautionary principle. So they considered all the risk and they said that might as well not allow the field testing of GMO talong because there could be negative environmental and social effects. The Supreme Court said, and it was, the ruling was penned by Justice Marvik Leonin, uh, since scientific advice plays a key role in GMO regulation, scientists have a responsibility to address and communicate uncertainty to policymakers and the public. The important fact here is this, okay? The scientist experts that uh, the Supreme Court um, consulted or to give, uh, to give evidence did not really agree on the, on the negative or positive effects of GMO talo. And the Supreme Court noted that um, they were not able to communicate the uncertainty in a very effective way to policymakers and the public. So the court had to decide, make use on legal precedents that rather, uh, rather prevent or have a restraining order on the testing of GMO talong in the field. This is the important point here. The court is not in the business of weighing scientific advice. The court is in the business of looking at the legal frameworks and the legal remedies to make sure that the, the common good is protected. And it was the responsibility of the scientists to communicate the uncertainty, whether to policymakers and the court, what, what, what those uh, uncertainties are. And unfortunately, the scientists were not able to do that in a very effective way. However, in 2016, the ruling was just reversed on a technicality because when the rulings were handed down, the field trials were over. 
and the biosafety permits had expired when the case was heard. But that's just a technicality. The ruling still remains there in the, in the proceedings of the Supreme Court. So the lesson here is the scientist should be able to consult with the wider public and also to communicate to them the uncertainty of scientific conclusions, at least with regards to genetically modified organisms. Now in New Zealand, there was a debate in New, New Zealand parliament about whether to regulate the use of Wi-Fi, because there's evidence to show that radio frequency and microwaves have risks for causing cancer. Now the question is, if there's a very strict application of the precautionary principle, and just because there's not much evidence and the New Zealand Supreme Court decided to ban Wi-Fi, what would have been the effect on New Zealand society? We know that Wi-Fi is not so important in productivity, especially now in the pandemic to do our usual things that we do. Uh, Pre-pandemic, we have to do it through remote means or, or digital means. So it's possible that if we ban Wi-Fi, if Wi-Fi is banned just because it has the chance of, having, of causing cancer, then the outcome would rather be more negative than, than positive. What, because the, whatever information we have on scientific information we have on microwaves and cancer, the evidence tends to suggest that the low level microwave exposures that we have is not enough for a significant chance of people getting cancer. But of course, I read a study about this. It, uh, one estimate you'll catch brain cancer is if you put your head in front of a microwave transmitter of a cell site, but hardly anyone would do that. I don't know if anyone would ever do that, put their head in front of a microwave transmitter. So anyway, so what, happened, what did the New Zealand government do is actually to have a more nuanced application to regulate uh, places where you can put Wi-Fi and put safety notices and hazard notices on Wi-Fi. Because if Wi-Fi is banned, a lot of people would rather be dead, okay? Because they can't, they can't do their digital uh, connected lifestyle if Wi-Fi is banned. Now, the other important uh, event of this uh, in the last 10 years is actually the Fukushima nuclear disaster, which happened 10 years ago. The disasters were so extreme that all backup measures failed. Now, this is where uh, scientific information, there was a lot of scientific information on earthquakes, engineering designs, but still the uncertainty of a major a major failure of the engineering interventions, though it was very small, was there. And so this led a lot of people in Japan to think about how to really manage risks. Now, managing risk and communicating risk and uncertainties is so important in post-thermal science, especially in disaster, disaster risk reduction. Okay? For example, the current uh, director of PVOX, uh, Dr. Re René Solidum, uh, keeps on telling the public that there will be a big one, which means the earthquake, and earthquakes are happening now, and people are more knowledge knowledgeable about them because the PVOX keeps on reporting them as they happen through social media. However, most of these earthquakes are very low in magnitude that people don't even notice them, but there will, there's a big chance, or a significant chance that we'll have a very strong earthquake which may result in 30,000 deaths and all hospitals will be overwhelmed. And North and South Manila will be isolated as the bridges would collapse across the Pasig River. So what is the advice? We need to be prepared and be resilient. Now, given the pandemic situation, we know now what it means that hospitals will be overwhelmed. <laughs> But we haven't got to the stage that we know here in Metro Manila that you have 30,000 people dying in, in, in an hour because of, a, because of a buildings collapsing because of earthquakes. So what does uh, Dr. Solidum recommend? We should have so-called disaster imagination in which we 
foresee all the uncertainties and risk and properly communicate this to people so they will prepare and change their behavior. In fact, one of the important points in disaster risk reduction is that people will change their behaviors as a response to these potential natural hazards. So the chances of them getting injured or losing their lives or losing their property will be much less uh, compared to as if they did not prepare for the disaster. This is so post-normal because we are assess individual citizens are assessing their risk and deciding for themselves based on the science information provided by PVOX on what is the best way for them to lower their risk and be more resilient. And I think people are already familiar about drop, cover, and hold during an earthquake. Now, in post-normal science, we need two bodies of knowledge. First is the scientific one, which uses the systematic uh, and scientific method. No? And this is scientifically constructed because we use a particularly scientific way to create knowledge and the dominantly culturally constructed knowledge in which the scientific knowledge is within, okay? This culturally constructed knowledge. And so in order to understand the intersection between the scientific knowledge and the culturally constructed one, we need the social and the cultural sciences and the humanities in order to put the proper, proper frameworks of understanding. Because we need to discriminate between the scientifically solid core of knowledge versus the added other culturally convenient or politically convenient knowledge claims. Now, this is so important in the whole COVID-19 narrative that we have now. The solid core of knowledge says that uh, SARS-CoV-2 can be transmitted in, in close contact. So, so people will have to wear masks. And vaccination is so important in lessening the risk. But what is the politically convenient knowledge claim? If your constituents are not for vaccination and you're a politician and you use the scientific, no, scientific findings to say that, okay, we'll go vaccination because the science says so, people may not vote for that politician. So it's more convenient for the politician to, to dampen the scientific evidence and come up with an alternative knowledge. It could be using ivermectin. <laughs> so this whole idea of discriminating between scientific, scientific knowledge and the politically convenient knowledge is so important in post-normal science. And that's why the, there's a need for the social sciences and the humanities to provide the, pre, the, the proper framework. Now. We know now that science and politics, the distinctions are no longer that clear. Scientists are now working with politicians and they have to be, they should know their politics also. Another thing to remember is that uh, science, uh, science policies and technological policies are related from uh, the change of government. It's needed in governance, but governance is also determined by the priorities of the governments implementing the, gover the governing, that's governance. And so we need more people to look into this now. So perhaps in the new fields of studies like ma environmental management or STS, is very important in understanding this politics and science and non-distinction these days. And there's an inherent complexity in understanding risk. The politicians, the government, and the public, and the scientists would need to understand the complexity and determine the risks and weigh them appropriately. So they would come up with a policy-oriented risk assessment or risk response. Okay, the approach was used in the Baltic Sea catchment assessment. Uh, this is uh, similar to what was, what was approached by the IPCC in climate change. You know? The IPCC used post-normal post -normal paradigm in coming up with uh, recommendations for policies for climate change. 
So the Baltic Sea effort is uh, the what the the country surrounding the Baltic Sea in Northern Europe. Okay. Um, they wanted to come up with policies, science informed policies to manage the environment because the Baltic Sea is one of the most polluted bodies of water in the world because all the industrialized countries of Europe are, are affecting it. And the Baltic Sea is relatively isolated from the rest of the Atlantic Ocean. So what they did, they decided is to first to assess the scientific knowledge separately from the political knowledge about the Baltic Sea and come up with a consensus and identify each and every scientific information that would be needed in, in policy making and the politics of that and identify the, the outcomes, whether positive or negative, especially in the issue of grayness where there is very uncertain scientific information and but that is needed the scientific information is needed by the politicians to craft policy decisions to protect the Baltic Sea environment. And so they came up with two publications. First is the scientific assessment, this uh, assessment for climate change of the Baltic Sea Basin and the po political and uh, policy assessment, climate change in the Baltic Sea area. And the different science, the scientists and the policy makers and the governments of the different countries surrounding the Baltic Sea approved the two. So with two important documents, to, one is to, to assess the scientific information and the political and the policy environment and see what could be done. They were able to come up with a recommendation. Now, of course, uh, you need to look at the how people view the problem of climate change. No? But remember, this is a European society where a lot of people are quite familiar with climate change uh, topics. Remember, this is the region where the famous uh, climate advocate Greta Thunberg is from. <laughs> Uh, anyway, a lot of people are really familiar with climate change. No? So they do not, mo most of the Europeans who live here do not, do not say it's not true. Okay? <laughs> Unlike in America, in which there are a lot of climate change deniers, but in this place, it's not. So that's a social context. So it would be easier for scientists to inform the policymakers because the policymakers and the politicians are elected by people who are quite familiar with climate change. So, uh, so it's easier for the scientific information to contribute to policy that would be for the greater political and social good of the communities around the Baltic Sea. As you can see here, no, climate change here is shifted to the sick, uh, to the, on a, on a scale of one to seven. Okay, so most people are acceptant, accepting of climate change in this, in, in this area. Okay. Although in some, play, in, in some issues, okay, uh, like uh, maybe here it's changes in marine ecosystems. Perhaps a lot of people are not that familiar, but still it's not really bad. A lot of people are aware, okay? Sea level rise and things like that. Now, we come now to the role of science consultants. Now, who are these people? Now, in the Baltic Sea assessment, you have your academic scientists doing research and also the government policymakers. Now, the important thing here is uh, scientists are so bit busy doing research that uh, communicating science or linking with policymakers, uh, they don't have enough time to do that. So here comes the science consultants. They would be the bridge between the two. So what do the science consultants do? They actually provide advice. More, more importantly, they moderate and translate scientific concepts to clients and stakeholders. So the scientific information provided by, uh, by scientists, academic papers, this would have to be translated into I'm not calling it laymanizing because that is quite no longer correct to say. You know? uh, we're saying it, it, it's going to be translated to a language that will be understood 
by a particular audience. In this case, the audience for this in the Baltic Sea assessment is essentially the government and policymakers. You cannot consider your government and policymakers as layman as the ordinary citizens because they're expert in particular in their particular uh, endeavors of government and governance. So it has to be translated into language that be understood by the gov governing. And, uh, and they would come up help come up with a consensus between the government and the scientists and the public at large and consider the welfare of clients and stakeholders in applying scientific interventions, which means the public is really important here. And of course, to translate risk to estimate the risk. So let me give you an example here. Five consultants for address the same question, uh, okay? Uh, how do you protect a, a strategic freshwater resource, okay? Um, Different consultants have different uh, assessments. No, uh, consultant one says that the whole freshwater resource resource is not really much uh, much a threat, but consultant two says otherwise because it's more red here. Consultant three he takes a more middle position. Consultant four the same thing, and consultant five takes a position that only one small area here is a threat, but most are at are well protected. So the job of the science consultant or advisor is to synthesize all of this information and come up with a general recommendation which actually weighs down all the risks. So perhaps it's possible that they may come up to a recommendation that is closest to consultant three's recommendation because it protects most of the area by rec but recognizing that there are also less vulnerable and well-protected areas. So this is the famous uh, watermelon graph of Kuntovich and Rovets. Okay? Most normal science as we understood it, understand it now is actually about decision-making, which in, requires scientific information. The problem is there might or might not be enough scientific information. Now, if we're dealing with scientific research in the lab, we have a lot of scientific information, but that's not enough for us to make a decision, okay? And since everything in the laboratory or, con or in, our, in scientific, most scientific research are could be controlled, the factors can be controlled. So the uncertainty is quite low, but you can only make certain decisions with that. No, uh, What's happening in the, in the outside the lab is more complex. Obviously every scientist would, would realize, would recognize this, that uh, the lab, everything is controlled, but once you in the field, everything is up for grabs, okay? Uh, everything is, unpredictable. A lot of the things are unpredictable. You have to look at emerging statistical patterns on the behavior of your complex systems to at least make an, make a, have a grip on, on how the system functions. Now, since a lot of our decisions, especially in complex environmental problems or even in the pandemic requires very high stakes, you have to decide now and we don't have enough scientific information the job of the consultant is actually to collect as much scientific information and translate that in immediately. And if that is successful and there is consensus, while realizing the limitations of the scientific data that we have right now, but we need to act, then that is in the realm of post-normal science. So we're able to decide now while managing and knowing the fact that we don't have enough scientific information. Now, if that's the case, the only solution for that is to go and continue with scientific research. And that is a very a political decision that a lot of politicians can't get grip on, get, 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 can't get a grip on because uh, a lot of countries really do not put much into science research. You know? Because in, at the early stages of scientific research, some of the findings may not be politically convenient for them. But in the long run, for the good of society, the scientific information is important. Also, most governments do not uh, are elected. No? Okay. 
most governments in the world now are, have a semblance of democracy. <laughs> now, whether they're truly democratic or not is, uh, is something subject to debate. No? But some have the, have, are more or less have the semblance of democracy, like our government here in the Philippines. We, elect, we will have an election next year. We elect our national officials. No? What will be their... Will they find science information, let's say, for disaster risk reduction, politically convenient or inconvenient? Those are things that we need to, to answer. And perhaps the consultants would help in coming up with consensus and convincing every stakeholder that scientific information is important, but we need consultation and we need more research. Now, of course, consultants can only act on the scientific evidence available. And sometimes if there's not enough, they will fail to translate the science into something that will be understandable to government, to policymakers, and society. And so this is where the citizen scientists come in. You know? Citizen scientists are people who do not have professional qualifications in science, but they know how to do science. Now, because the, uh, our system now is, okay, uh, let's say if you want to be a doctor, you have to go to medical school and get trained, okay? They get the professional credentials. If you want to be a lawyer, you have to go to law school, pass the bar and practice law. A lot of the things that we're doing require professional qualifications. No? For example, uh, you may meet a lay person who is knowledgeable about the law, but never studied in law school. Okay? Of course, that person cannot appear in court, no, obviously. But you'd pick up some right information from that person. No? And uh, citizen scientists are analogously like that. No? Uh, they know the science. Probably they receive a basic science training in their basic education. And they have day jobs. And on the side, they do science. Now, most of the citizen scientists... The earliest citizen scientists are the bird watchers. No? Uh, they've been doing this bird watching for more than 200 years. It started in England. And over the years, they developed their own techniques. Eventually, they were, violate, uh, they were validated by professional scientists. And now they work hand in hand with the professional scientists. The ornithologists do not, do not uh, look at the citizen scientists or the birders, as they say as less capable people. In fact, they extend the science of ornithology because you cannot have your professional ornithologists in many places at the same time. There are more bird watchers than them. So what do the citizen scientists do? They collect a lot of scientific information and they work with the professional scientists okay, in consultation. So they are very important in post-normal science for that reason alone, no? uh, because they are actually, what we say, extending the participation in the scientific process. No? And that is important in post-normal science, so public stakeholder participation. So everybody, let's say in the case of the bird watchers, everybody is working within imperfections. No? Uh, the imperfection of the professional science community is that they don't have enough people to be there all, always. No? They have other things to do, right? The bird watchers are not PhDs, okay? but they know how to collect data. Everybody will have to work deliberatively, consultatively within those limitations. No? And we have to understand that science is only one part of the relevant evidence. No? Critical dialogue is needed on the strength and relevance of evidence. And the interpretation of evidence and attribution of policy meaning to knowledge has to be democratized. So it's no longer politically correct, uh, as we can put it that way, that you have your scientists dictating on the public on what to accept or what to not, or what not to accept. They, everybody has to consider the evidence and the attribution and meaning of that evidence has to be more democratic. But it doesn't mean that all views are to be entertained because there is what we call knowledge quality assessment, which is empowering all the stakeholders in this deliberative process. So everybody would have to know the scientific problem, the stakeholders and what they can do best to their ability 
select the indicators, okay? appraise the knowledge base, and map the uncertainties. So, uh, for example, in the case of bird watchers, though, let's say they were assigned to monitor bird biodiversity. Okay? That's a problem that they can easily grasp. No? And the professional ornithologist would know who the stakeholders are. And both the ornithologists and the citizen scientists select the indicators. No? Maybe the, the in, in many cases, much of the number crunching for ecological statistics is done by the professionals, but the, but the citizen scientists collect uh, as much data as they can and they learn some of the basic techniques of statistics. So everybody works in a more or less harmonious and, seem, uh, and seamless manner. Then everybody can appraise the, the knowledge base to different seminars, webinars, or, or consultations, and everybody will now have to map the relevant uncertainties. Like one of the questions is where, we, where are they going to put up the in, important bird area or IBA, which is a focus of conservation uh, initiatives. Now, you just can't put an IBA based on the scientific opinion of the professionals alone. You need the bird watchers because they have all the data. Anyway, in, in the Netherlands, they already have protocols for that, okay? To make sure that uh, the citizens, the policymakers, and the scientists more or less are, could come up to a, con a consensus on how to approach a problem. So we need to choose our stakeholders. As I said, not all people can be involved in a citizen science uh, effort, no? Why? Okay. Why participate? We have to ask the people who volunteer. Okay. What should participation be about? Okay, uh, not all volunteers can give the same amount of time, okay? People with day jobs can only give part of their time usually on weekends, okay? So that should be made clear, no? And because citizen scientists are not paid, <laughs> remember? They're volunteers. Now, who to involve, okay? And that would be something that the management of the research effort would have to deal with. The management would be composed of the professional scientists and the citizen scientists, no? Which will decide how much participation each and every person involved would have to do. And what form of participation? Now, uh, no, about bird watchers, though, I have a friend who's a very successful uh, Chinoy businessman. He can, he can afford to do all this bird conservation work because he has his own time and, and his business is successful. No? So it's a bien, uh, he can plan his own time. No? Of course, he doesn't give 100% of his time to bird watching. No, kundi yung negosyo niya will will ano, he will not be able, he's no longer looking after the business kung ganun, no? But of course, uh, he's a person that has the money and the time to put in more. Okay, compared to some of the other bird watchers who have day jobs, they can only do it on weekends. Now, how do we formalize all of these? No? Uh, in other countries, there is a formalized structure now, which we call government science advice, uh, in which the scientists advise government uh, using the protocols that are similar, that have been agreed upon. And the government considers these as important inputs to governance, and so it will be used for decision making. So this has happened in the COVID-19 pandemic. No? Uh, in England, uh, Brit uh, UK, you know, in the United Kingdom, okay, you have the Scientific Advice Group in Emergencies or SAGE composed of doctors and other medical scientists and social scientists and even people in the humanities you know, to put the proper cultural uh, framework for COVID-19 response. You know? And um, whatever they come up as a recommendation based on the scientific information of researchers and doctors, then that would be used by the government of the of Britain to come up with policies. Of course, the, the system isn't perfect. No? Politicians are politicians. No? Even in this situation, yung some of the 
some of the recommendations were not politically convenient for the government. So, so they tend to, to put that in the back burner. Unfortunately, nung ginawa yun, nag-spike yung, nag-surge. Eh? And so it became a political controversy in, in, in the United Kingdom. But even then, at least you have a structure which mandates the government to seriously consider whatever scientific advice that was given by their scientists. Now, uh, about science no, uh, and scientific research, we know that we have to make sure that the public has a stake in it. But if we're giving a stake to the public, they should be involved in almost all aspects of it. Uh, based on their competencies. Now, it is really stupid for anyone to say that the public has no competency in science and technology. That is so elitist, no? Unfortunately, we still have people who have that, those views, though. What is most imp more important is to realize that the public can input to science and technology research based on their own competencies. Of course, you cannot expect your ordinary citizen who knows uh, science and technology to do the mathematical modeling for COVID-19. Even, even I can't do that. Right? Although I understand the concepts, no, but I, I'm just not, I don't have enough competency to do that. So, okay, so um, the important point here is scientific research no, and determination of policies. It could be people don't participate at all. They just listen to your press release and that's it. <laughs> okay. Or you ask them to appear in a so-called webinar consultation meeting just to listen to you without asking their you know, inputs. And that's what we call tokenism. I think, in my opinion, here in the Philippines, we are still at stage step number three. We inform a lot of people about scientific research, but we don't really get, get what they think about scientific research. However, what in post-normal science, what is, uh, what is the objective is to have citizen power in which there's citizen, a lot of citizen control in determining the direction of scientific research. No? Uh, which means it doesn't mean that you do, do away with the professional scientists, but professional scientists will have to work closely and in consultation with a lot of citizens. Of course, uh, as we said earlier, what kind of participation of the citizens would be, no? Uh, maybe they could we have to ask them that which what what can they do okay uh, and so perhaps well based on experience most of them are willing to do the information and education uh uh campaigns no that is good yeah because people can actually plan their time doing that yeah, but they, they can they can plan their time doing that no so-called iecs okay and those who have enough time to, do, to, to give, they can really assist the professional scientists in a lot of work. Like, somewhat, like what some bird watchers are doing globally. <laughs> so I read about a bird, watching, a bird, a bird watcher who's uh, with an ornithological research team in Africa looking at endangered species of birds. So that person probably has retired. So he has a lot of time to give in scientific research. But of course, if you have a day job, then what you can do is a little bit less. So in conclusion, uh, post-normal science is about extending scientific consensus, extending participation. So a lot of people will know what the outcomes of science and technology are. Okay? And to give citizens a stake and responsibility for the outcomes of scientific research. Of course, they should be involved in identifying the problem. What is the problem? They should be involved in looking at the political interests. People should be involved in 
estimating and quantifying the scientific data or even assessing how good the scientific data is, no? depending on their competencies. No? Uh, also, the people should be consulted at each and every step of the way. If they consent, then that's fine, which means they accept the consensus. Or if they oppose or protest, then we have to find out why. Okay. It could be that the, the, the opposition or the protest has really some important reason behind it. Maybe we're not acting too much democratically in extending participation to citizens in, current, in terms of science and technology. And again, uh, what will be the outcomes? Because whatever the outcomes, everybody is accountable to it. So, uh, let's say if the pandemic response of the government has totally flopped or screwed up, no? And if people have no stake in that, then they will just render the government accountable. Okay? But if the people have an important contribution to coming up with COVID-19 policies to control the disease, then if it flops, then people will be accountable for it. People are not just there to follow the rules. They should understand the rules. And in some cases, they should be actively part in making up the rules. And the common denominator in post-normal science is all of those rules, have to, or all of those interventions, policy interventions to a problem like COVID-19 or climate change or data privacy. All of these, okay, all of these interventions or, or all of these things, problems that require science and technology input, okay? The citizens should have a part in coming up with the policies or even generating the data. So that's exactly what post-normal science is. Uh, this is now more or less the accepted paradigm between people who are working in STS. Of course, let's say it's a paradigm. No? Remember, paradigms can change, no? So we cannot say that oh, post-normal science ain't forever. That, 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 that's a stupid thing to say, no? Because there might be better approaches than post-normal science. Actually, a lot of other scholars and, science and researchers in STS are proposing alternative ways. Because there are limitations in post-normal science. Eh? Um, and of course, we do not have time in STS to look at these limitations. Perhaps when there's a policy when we talk about policy, then we're going to talk more of the certain limitations. Now, in, in fact, in Philippine society, we see certain limitations no? here. No? But it doesn't mean it cannot work. No? Uh, perhaps it's proper to contextualize it in, in different cultural contexts. No? While it works in a country like Sweden, except during the COVID-19 pandemic, <laughs> or a country like Germany, okay? It's working in some countries. I think it's, uh, they're applying it in Malaysia, okay? Uh, in the Philippines, we really don't know, no? But one thing is important. Now, our, a lot of our civil society organizations are premised on the importance of public participation and consultation and democratic consultation, democratic participation. So I think there is already the governance culture in the Philippines. Actually, there is. No? Whether that is applied or not is another question. No? Uh, in some LGUs, they're really good at it, no? but some LGUs are more traditional. They just uh, have tokenism in public participation. No? But I've, I've seen LGUs that are, they really take it seriously that there will be extended participation in governance, especially uh, one I went to a town in a coastal town, uh, yung kanilang mangrove rehabilitation strategy actually was, uh, a lot of the scientific information was inputted by the residents of the barangay. Of course, they were, they were assisted by the professional environmental scientists, but they came up with a nice policy for protecting their environment. So uh, that is, those are the things about post-normal. It, it has a lot of promise, but we need to be careful about it also because it doesn't mean that post-normal, 
everything will come out right. <laughs> it may come out wrong, okay, or, or negative outcome. So that is post-normal science, okay, and so, um, so with that, I, I'd like to wish everyone a pleasant day ahead, okay, and keep well, be happy, and keep well. So thank you again, and good day. <laughs>